terms. It, it, it builds up and builds up and builds up and then the climax and then whew, the next day. I've entitled our message, Christmas is over, now what? Right? What, what, what do we do now that Christmas is over? Well, for believers, we have to understand that this is something that we celebrate each and every day. It's like Easter. It's like the resurrection. We just don't celebrate it on Easter. We just don't celebrate it one day. We celebrate it every day. And even though some people may feel let down, Christians should not be let down because we can rejoice that the Savior of the universe has been born. And because he has been born, we have life. Amen. I heard this poem. I thought it was kind of neat. I wanted to share it with you. It talks about uh, Christmas being over. It says, "'Twas the day after Christmas and all through the town, the ones who weren't Christians were feeling let down. The stockings weren't hung by the chimney anymore, and boxes and wrapping paper covered the floor. The kitchen was covered from floor to ceiling with enough dirty dishes to set mother reeling. The children were whining over what they didn't get, and rather than sharing, sharing, they all threw a fit. The malls were bustling with post-Christmas shoppers, Searching for bargains on racks and on hoppers. The salesmen looked haggard, the shoppers looked worse as credit cards flew out of wallet and purse. There were no joyful sounds of carolers singing, and the only bells heard were registers ringing. The scene was altogether too grim, for all the people didn't know him. If only this unhappy crowd could know that the spirit of Christmas isn't tied with a bow. And stacked in piles underneath the tree, he lives forever in you and in me. He didn't start in presents piled up in a sleigh. He started with Christ being born in, his, in, in the hay. The perfect gift from our Father above sent to us sinners to show us his love. He came without wrapping or boxes or strings, no glitter or glamour or other vain things. He came with the promise of hope for all men that even in death we have life again. Now the next face you encounter, covered with strife, introduce them to Jesus and change their whole life. Teach them that Christmas is a daily thing that comes from intimately knowing the King. Amen. We have to intimately know the King. The true, true meaning of Christ and Christmas should not be a celebration that we anticipate once a year. Matter of fact, it shouldn't be a celebration that we just take part in once a week on Sundays. For Christmas and for Christians, in our hearts, it should be every day of the year. And how do we celebrate this? We celebrate it by intimately knowing the King. For on that first Christmas day, 2,000 years ago, the world had no idea that God had sent His Son wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger. Most today do not understand. If you were to ask people what Christmas is about, they'll tell you gifts. They'll, they'll tell you the tree. They'll, they'll tell you spend time with family. Look, that, those things are nice. But what is truly as important is what we understand about Christmas, and most importantly, what we share. You see, the shepherds that we read about this morning, they knew. They knew what it was about. And, and, and that was an experience that they would never forget. I, I admit, I, I was just as excited for Christmas as everyone else. Christmas is an exciting time. We, we, we had a good time with our family. We, we had a good time sitting and talking. We had a good time just spending time with those that we love. Think about it. In preparation for Christmas, preachers preach about uh, Joseph and Mary and baby Jesus. Preachers preach about uh, the wise men. They preach about the shepherds. But what about after Christmas? You know what a lot of people come to the realization of? Dad! One of the songs we heard in our Christmas uh, uh, radio on the way there and back is a parody of the 12 Days of Christmas. And my, my one favorite part is the guy, I don't know if you ever heard this, um, who's um, ringing up the lights. And he gets so frustrated, he's like, one light goes out, they all go out. Yeah, you ring them up. And, uh, but there's one part in here that says, five months of bills. <laughs> Because that's what people 
think Christmas is about spending, spending, spending. Matter of fact, I, listen, I don't have any statistics for you this morning, but I did find something very interesting. It's been found that Christmas is the number one time of year where people feel pressure to overspend. Several recent surveys found that a significant number of Amer uh, Americans not only feel the pressure to spend, but they actually do spend more than they had anticipated. Nearly two-thirds of adults feel pressure to spend more than they'd like to on Christmas presents. I don't know if that's you. I, I, we, we try to stay in our little Christmas club budget that I put back every every month and with our family being so spread out sometimes it's easier to send money or gift cards or e-gift cards nowadays you know uh, this has nothing to do with it but i'm just going to share with you anyway back in february we, we got nikki and jesse valentine's cards and i put ten dollars in each of them i thought that was a nice gesture you know they never got it and it was going from here to baldwin county never 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 got the cards never got the ten dollars so we decided if we couldn't see them on their birthday, since I have their bank account numbers anyway, I'm just going to go put their money in their bank account. That way, we don't have to worry about it. But people overspend. They feel the pressure. But this morning, I want us to see something different about after Christmas. It's not about a letdown. It's not about the kids being disappointed. It's not about uh, the after Christmas sales. What it's about is what we do with Christ now that we've celebrated his birth. So we don't have any bulletins today. But if you have a piece of paper and you'd like to take notes, I want us to see three particular things about what we need to do now that Christmas is over. The first thing is we need to see Jesus. See him for who he is. The, the, the shepherds did. <coughs> Verse 17, it simply says, and I'm just going to use the first part, when they had seen him. Think about it this way. In order for the shepherds to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ, they had to go and see him. If we want to have a personal relationship and a saving knowledge of Jesus, then we have to see him for who he is, the Savior of the universe. Do you know what this passage actually reminds me of? The story of Nicodemus coming to Jesus that, um, that faithful night to ask him about who he was. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He probably knew the Old Testament, the Torah, better than anyone on earth at this point in time. So the Bible says that, that he, he, he knew that there was a promise of a Messiah. The Bible says that he had seen Jesus. He had heard about Jesus. He, he knew he had performed miracles. He knew about his teaching, and so now he comes to visit Jesus at night. Why at night? Well, the scripture doesn't really tell us. Maybe he was being cautious. Maybe he was somewhat afraid of the others on the Jewish council. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he had insomnia. Uh, we just, he couldn't sleep. He just thought he'd go out for a walk. We, we, we don't know. But the Bible tells us that he comes to see Jesus, and he says to him, Rabbi, we know, listen to this, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. That's critical. He says, for no one could perform the signs that you are doing if God were not with him. This seems to me that he is a combination of a little bit curious, and he might be leaning towards um, having an apt to believe in who Jesus is. But Jesus cuts to the chase, and he says, I tell you that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. Now let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a conversation with maybe uh, someone who um, doesn't know the things of Christ that much and you're, you're trying to talk about the spiritual, but they kind of have that deer in a headlight look? You know, they, they, they have this blank stare. They have no idea what you're talking about. Well, I think after Nicodemus heard the scripture, that was probably what his demeanor looked like. How do I know that? Because he asks. He says, how, uh, or surely a man can't be born again when he is old. He, he has like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Jesus explains that he's not talking about entering to his mother's womb. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. The Holy Spirit was the catalyst for the virgin birth. The Holy Spirit is the catalyst for us as finite humans to be born again. 
The Holy Spirit is the catalyst for our eyes to be opened so we can see things that which are spiritual of God's kingdom. And the Holy Spirit is catalyst in us that uh, allows us to, to stir and to want to share that message with others. The same Spirit that brought Jesus' birth about is the same Spirit that brings about our new birth. Nicodemus might not have understood everything that Jesus was saying, but I firmly believe that he knew that it was God who made all things new. Amen. Being born again means an inner awakening. And I believe that Jesus is literally, literally saying that he is going to heal our hearts. You know, I talked a few months, and me and my brothers kind of, we get together, we ain't seen each other in a couple of years, and we start talking about world events, and we start talking about politics, and we, uh, my brother lives outside Baltimore, and he shared that um, in their newscast that they had broke the record in Baltimore from murders this year than they had last year. And you remember me talking about this in a sermon, and after one of the shootings, I said, tell me what... You know, because everybody talks about gun control and new gun laws. What law on the books would have prevented one of these shootings? It's not a gun problem. It's a heart problem. Amen. It's not a knife problem that London is dealing with because they've taken all the guns. It's a heart problem. Back in 1948, Ohio State University's Department of Research did a heart surgery on a gentleman who was 33 years old. And I thought that was interesting because it wasn't like a, a hospital. It was a department of research. <clears throat> I, and I thought about one thing that came to my mind was when Kara had her um, appendicitis, we took her to Grove Hill Hospital. And it was about to burst, and so they, they had to get her rushed right to the ER. And I remember the door said labor delivery, labor delivery slash surgery. <laughs> and that's what I thought about when, when I read this article about Ohio State University's research department. During this open heart surgery. Well, this man who was 33 years old, when he was a kid, had been shot accidentally by a playmate uh, with a 22 caliber rifle. Well, the bullet was lodged in his heart, but it didn't kill him. But over time, that bullet that had been encased in him, a lime deposit began to grow and to form over his heart, causing him to have difficulty breathing. And it was a stony sheath that had to be removed. A coating that had to be lifted. Listen, listen to this. They had to be removed from the heart as an orange is peeled. Hmm. When the operation was over, it was deemed successful. Immediately the pressure of the heart was reduced and it responded by expanding and pumping normally. When this man woke up, you know what his first words were? I feel a thousand percent better already. Folks, this is a parable of life. Our hearts develop a hard coding over time. A, a coding because of accidents and incidents that we experience. A, a coding that, that is there because of deposits of, uh, of thousands of deceits and, and, and hurtful things and, uh, and, and things that happen to us. Uh, we, we call it the hardening of the heart in spiritual terms. Our heart is hardened by the pressures of circumstances, and inevitably, our hearts become smothered and insensitive to that which is spiritual. It gets to the point where we find it easier to sneer than we do to pray. We find it easier to work rather than to worship. And what it boils down to is our hearts needs a spiritual operation, one that we go through at Christmas. We get excited. We get joyful. We, 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 we get to be like little kids. I know for me personally, listen, I enjoy giving. I enjoy seeing my kids open their presents and, and, and being surprised. But as an adult, I know when I get a card for Christmas, I can almost guarantee there's a gift card in there, baby. <laughs> I'm going to Walmart. Matter of fact, I told our kids, I said, listen, don't give me anything. But if you do, Amazon or eBay, they're my two favorite stores. But I get just excited. Why do we get just excited only at Christmas time? We need to be joyful the other 364 days of the year. Christmas is over. Now what? Well, now we have to see Jesus 
for who he really is. Second thing I want us to see, Christmas is over. Now what? We have to share Jesus. Look at, look at what it said the shepherds did. After it said that they, uh, the angels had left and they, they hurried off and they, they found the baby. Look, when they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. Matter of fact, it goes on to say that Mary treasured all these things in her heart. Treasuring Jesus is something that we do not by keeping him to ourselves, but by making him known to the world. If he is that special to us, then we need to share him with others. We were talking to Ben's wife, Emily. You know, they're from New England. They, they, they say, you know, we park the car in the garage and we go to Hobby God and um, what really shocked me was, I, I'm, I'm a Southerner, and, and I love the Red Sox, but I found out her parents were Yankees fans. I'm like, what? But she was saying how it irritates her that Northerners, the, the New Englanders, don't pronounce the E-R at the end of the names. And then we're talking about baseball in Yankee Stadium, and she made this comment. She said, yeah, I haven't been to Yankee Stadium since the Gita days. And Kara looks at me and said, what? Is she, was she talking about Derek Jeter, the baseball player? Yeah, she said Jeter. She ain't been in. I kind of called her out on it. I said, you didn't like people who say ER. And she said, I don't. And I just said Derek Jeter. But we talk about that and we get excited about that. If we get so excited about stuff that have no, no, no significance whatsoever, why don't we get excited about Jesus, the one who saved us, the one who redeemed us, the one who gives us eternal life? Amen. Why, why don't we get excited about that? Ponder that. In your heart. I heard about this pastor in Great Britain, in New Wales. He was going to start his first Sunday. True story. The weeks leading up before he was to give his first sermon, he decided to kind of do a litmus test for his people. They didn't know it. Maybe that was not very fun for them. But he decided to grow out his beard kind of scraggly. He decided to go buy some old clothes, rip them up, cake them in dirt, soak them in beer, look scruffy, put on a wig. And the very first Sunday he was to preach, he sat on the steps of the church with a wine bottle beside him as if he were a homeless drunk. And wouldn't you know that every church member that came into that church that morning, anxiously awaiting to hear the first sermon of the new pastor, walked right by that homeless looking drunk and went right into the church. You can imagine their surprise when on that morning he gets up to preach and the shock in the congregation when this homeless man comes up there takes off his wig and says I'm your new pastor. I won't go into what he said in his sermon but it wasn't very nice. He did say how Jesus said that when we help one of the least of these, we are helping Jesus. And that he was very disturbed. You see, just like the shepherds who went away that first Christmas and told everybody everything that they had heard, we need to do the same. How do we do that? Through acts of kindness, through showing love to others. Like the angels who interrupted the shepherds' sleep, I believe the world today needs the light of Christ to come and wake them up from their sleep. I believe America today needs to be woken up from their sleep through the light of Christ that only we can bring as believers. A few years ago, Casting Crowns wrote a song that was entitled, While You Were Sleeping. And I thought it was appropriate to share with you this morning <coughs> the last stanza of that Song because it starts out by talking about Israel, it starts talking um, talking about Jerusalem, and then it talks about America. And it says, United States of America looks like another silent night. As we're sung to sleep by philosophies that save the trees, yet kill the children. While we're lying in the dark, there's a shout heard across the eastern sky. For the bridegroom has returned and he's carried his bride away in the night. America, what will we miss while we are sleeping? Will Jesus come again and leave us slumbering where we lay? America, we will go down in history 
as a nation with no room for its king. What have we done with the gifts and talents that God has given us? What have we done with the financial blessings that God has bestowed upon us? What have we done since we came to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ? Bill Bright, who founded Campus Crusade for Christ, wrote that less than 1% of Christians actively share their faith. We need to see Jesus. We need to share Jesus. And finally, Christmas is over. Now what? We need to praise Jesus. In verse number 20, the Bible says that the shepherds return glorifying and praising God for all the things that they have heard and have seen, which were just as they had been told. These shepherds had just witnessed the world's greatest birth announcement ever. Some would say that these shepherds had just witnessed the very first epic gender reveal. Have y'all ever seen those videos? They're getting more elaborate. I, I think I saw one that a fireman was trying to do something with fire and burned down a whole field. And if you're not familiar with them, gender reveal videos are when parents are expecting to find out if it's a boy or a girl. Like the, the nurse or the doctor will give it a piece of paper to their family. And they would... Um, I don't know, hit a piñata, and if blue comes out, it's a boy. If pink comes out, it's a girl. I found one that was funny I wanted to share with you. It's my video. It's a whole series of epic gender revealer fails. Where they try to do something, and it fails. And I could show 20 minutes, but I'm going to show, <coughs> show one. Now, y'all got to watch it. It's only seven seconds. I can't see. Let me get a full screen. All right, y'all ready? Let me set it up for you. They're doing it baseball style. In the baseball is either blue or pink. So when she tosses the ball to the husband, he hits the ball. In theory, the ball is supposed to burst open and the powder is supposed to come out. So let's see what happens. Buffer. Well, I guess it's 16 seconds. You ready? Here we go. seeing angels, a heavenly host, singing praises to God in the highest to share that Jesus was coming. I'm sure you've heard these words many times, but let me just remind you, and I don't have it all up here. <coughs> I'll just claim, as Nicodemus, a little insomnia, um, drove to Rhode Island through the night, uh, decided that I, I, once I did that, I realized, man, there's no traffic on the road at 1, 2 in the morning. This is nice if I can stay awake. <laughs> so we decided to do that uh, on the way home as well. So I didn't get all my PowerPoint the way I wanted. But, but let me start with verse number 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping their watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Listen, this is what I want to talk about. For I bring you good tidings that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in heaven. Peace on earth. And let that peace uh, to those on whom his favor rests. The angels came and made it personal. They said, I bring you good news. A Savior has been born to you. This will be a sign for you. You will find the baby. What the angels were ultimately saying is Jesus is your Savior. Jesus is your King. Jesus is your Christ. Jesus is your gift. A gift that comes straight for God just for you, sometimes 
We forget the fact, uh, or focus on the fact more, that for God so loved the world, that we forget for God so loved you, that he sent his one and only son. You know, when I was growing up, my parents, the way they did Christmas, the days leading up, I'm talking maybe even a couple weeks leading up, we'd have our Christmas tree at Thanksgiving. When they bought presents for the kids, they would wrap them and put them immediately under the tree. And they would just build up, build up, build up presents all around the tree. Well, do you know how that's a temptation for little kids? Seeing those presents weeks in advance, thinking, man, I can't touch them. Well, I remember this one particular Christmas. We had three identical boxes addressed to me and my two brothers. They were about this big. So one day, my parents weren't at home. And my older brother, Shannon, he got us, led us to open one of those boxes. <laughs> So slowly on the side, kids, don't try this at home now, next year. <laughs> slowly on the side, we opened those boxes. Just couldn't you see the rip of the tape? The first one was a 13-inch black and white television. Woo! It's the good old days. Put it back together. We weren't sure the other two might be, so we had to open at least one more. <laughs> slowly, like a, like a surgeon in operation. We opened that second one. It said, 13-inch black and white television. <laughs> so obviously we deduced that from the third one, it had to be a black and white television. But we had ruined the surprise that my parents had for us that we weren't going to be able to, well, we had to fake it on Christmas morning. <laughs> but imagine what it does to the kids. When my wife and I got married, we decided to wait until Christmas Eve to put all the presents up. The tree is empty and bare until Christmas Eve. The kids go to sleep, and then we bring out all the, all the presents. There would be no temptations to open presents behind our backs. <laughs> they, they, they couldn't see what something in a package looked like and try to guess it. They would know whose gifts were whose by either one of two ways, which I think this is very ingenious of my wife. One, either by their name being on it, obviously. Or two, she wraps each kid's presents in a certain color wrapping paper. So if it's Charlie Brown Christmas, Kara gets all Charlie Brown. If it's, I don't know, blue snowflakes, then Scott gets all blue snowflakes. So every present on it has blue snowflakes would be for him. That's how we know. But imagine a gift such as the Lord Jesus Christ being delivered to the world through the Virgin Mary and presented before these wise men and shepherds on Christmas morning. There's no greater gift than that. That, that, that. There's no anticipation anymore because he has come, he is living, and he is risen. So my question for you this morning is simply, what will you do with Jesus? How will you personally respond? Now I want you to look at the person beside you. I'll look at, at the person in front of you. I don't even want you to look at me because the gift that was given was for you. And you have to personally respond. And I want to close with this story because I love history. And um, we, we live in a very fast technology age. We can get information out like that. We have Facebook, we have uh, Snapchat, Instagram, uh, you know, we have Flock Note for our church. But back during the American Revolution, they didn't have that. <clears throat> and towards the end, there was a battle in Kentucky. It was called the Battle of Blue Lips. Not very many people have heard of it. It actually took place beside a stream for which um, the stream was named, is what it's called. But what we don't know about it is the battle should have never taken place. Why? Because the war was formally over. The British had surrendered. But because of where the stream and the battle took place in the, uh, around the mountains of Kentucky, it took a long time for communication to get there. You see, the angels coming to the shepherds 
was the ultimate form of communication in announcing the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Christ has won the victory over evil at Calvary. All that is left for us to do is to share that good news before it is too late. And if we praise him like we say we do, then we will want to share him with as many people as possible, as much as possible, before it is too late for them. So my question to you this morning is, what is it that you're pondering at Christmas? What is it that you've got in your heart? Maybe the Lord has laid someone on your heart. Maybe he has uh, you know, said that you, you need to reach out to someone and, and to, to encourage them, to lift them up, to let them know that you love them and that you're praying for them. Whatever it is, there needs to be a response. And during our time of invitation, I don't want you to leave here without responding to the Holy Spirit's tug that he puts on all of our hearts. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you, you, you're born again, but you're not living the way you're supposed to be. Today can remedy all that because the ultimate gift has been given. You just have to accept it. So during this time of invitation, ponder that most important question, where will it be that I will spend eternity? Will I hear those words upon judgment, well done, my good and faithful servant? Or depart from me, for I knew you not. Would you pray with me?